Thank you for the introduction. Good morning, everyone. Uh, you're welcome to use this. Uh, all right, I'm going to introduce you to my this today. Today, I'll be talking to you about electrical algorithms of crystal lasers that can be used for future uh, computer control networks, yeah, such as chip to chip and on chip interrupt. So, uh, so, applying chip uh, devices in in these networks, it is important to reduce uh, power consumption. Thus, the deduction of the laser active volume is very important. So, we can try to fabricate a photon crystal nanocap laser. However, the previous uh, development of the photon crystal laser uh, characteristics are very limited because uh, uh, some, uh, some problem has occurred. So, to improve the device performance, we try to introduce uh, but very detailed structure in the photonic crystal nanocavities. And that we call, that we call the lambda scale embedded at the division of photonic crystal lasers, or lead lasers. Now, this is outlined on my talk. After providing you the background, I to describe the structure and the fabrication of the electrically driven lead laser. Then I'll show you the dynamic characteristics with in terms of static and dynamic characteristics. And then I'll summarize my talk. So, the photonic devices are primarily targeted for the telecom network, such as the core, metal, and access network. In these networks, DMV lasers, moderators, detectors, and photonic integrated circuit consisting of these devices are important. The development of these, uh, these devices enable us to use, uh, uh, to construct a high capacity and flexible network with low cost. The development of devices is also critical for shorter distance. The development of XR enables us to use the optical link in the data, uh, data center and supercomputer because the uh, power consumption of the XR is very smaller than that of the DFB laser. So when we try to uh, introduce the optical link into the most short, extremely short distance, it is important to uh, introduce the non cavity lasers. And indeed, uh, recently, the CMOS is uh, part of the serious problem of the transmission energy of the device. It is important for the future uh, CMOS technologies. So this is uh, our uh, roadmap of the for use of photon, uh, photon technology into the uh, computer networks. As we try to the chip to chip interconnection and the memory chip, CMOS to uh, CPU to memory interconnection using the uh, polymer waveguide or uh, fiber waveguide. Then uh, we try to integrate with the silicon photonics devices to, to, uh, to construct the board uh, interconnection. Then uh, next trial will be uh, on chip interconnection. In this case, in our plan, uh, we uh, hybrid integrated with the CMOS with the uh, optical uh, circuit. Consists of the in, in the phosphide layer. Then I try to uh, more smarter function by using the optics. This is our goal. So, this is our uh, roadmap for the CMOS transistor used by IPRS. Uh, this plot line shows the uh, density of the transistor of the high performance MPU. The transistor density will be increased to 10 billion per square centimeter in 1922, and the probate also increased to up to 10 gigabits per second. So, however, the power consumption of, uh, of the CMOS CPU is a limited to about 200 mass, 200 watt. So, the energy for transferring the data must be decreased because uh, transferring the data in the CMOS is about 50% of the total power consumption of the CMOS. And this is described by Professor Mina in Stanford University. And in the future, 2022, the off chip interconnect will be required around the 10 femtojoule per bit. And for the on chip interconnect, it's less than 10 femtojoule per bit for the transceiver. So when we consider the 10 femtojoule per bit energy cost, so when we, when we modulated the 10 gig 
10 gigabit per second. So the power concentration is about 100 microwatt. This means that we modulate this 10 gigabit per second with 100 microwatt microampere. This is very severe uh, requirement. So this shows the uh, energy cost as a function of the active volume of the laser. This is called the DFP laser. This is divided to 100 gigabit per second. Uh, this is for the pixel. Pixel can be decreased by decreasing the uh, oxide aperture. And uh, so, uh, so technical university bearing uh, achieves less than 100 femtojoule per bit by using pixel. However, the uh, requirement of the computer on the 10 femtojoule per bit is region. So we must reduce, reduction, reduce the uh, active volume. So in this context, the many research group developed the photon crystal lasers. However, the characteristics is very limited because many uh, uh, research groups use a single active volume, active media, and free and uh, therefore the city slightly creates a high Q cavity. And in this structure, they have all active and they have that has say, a severe problem. Why the large summer resistivity of the indium gamma and phosphate radio? This is a calculated the results for the increase of the active region. When the heat source is put on active region with 100 microwatt, however, the active region temperature up to 77.2 degrees Celsius. This is very, uh, very uh, a serious problem for the laser. And, and it is also that there are no carrier confinement structure in this device, uh, previous developed for the crystal lasers. So to solve these problems, we try to uh, introduce a very detailed structure in the photonic crystal nano cavity. There is an uh, active embedded active region, and this uh, is buried with engine phosphide area. And this is the cross section of view. Uh, to prevent the wet chemical etching when uh, uh, fabricating the air weight structure. And the entire direction of the active region was parallel to its engine phosphide right? and This is important. And this is the calculated FDD uh, model for part of the device. Since the refractive index of the active region is slightly larger than the engine phosphide right? the uh, photon is uh, confinement without sifting the air hole. And the active volume and the modern volume is almost the same. So this means a very close to the uh, confinement, the optics uh, and the carrier. And cavity Q factor, in, in this case, we uh, uh, designed uh, without output weather structure of uh, the one over the medium. But it's not that, uh, in this case, we, uh, active region is embedded within a line detector wave. However, the overlap of the optical field and the output um, line diffuse the wave is very small. And the optical field is extended to this gamma in direction. So when we want to form, uh, uh, inter integrate the output wave, we should put on the output wave in this direction. And uh, this is the the result for uh, the uh, increase of the active region. Uh, in this case, uh, with, with the very detailed structure and uh, the calculation condition is the same as before, and the increase of the activity of temperature is just 6.7 Kelvin. This is because the uh, lithium phosphide is 10 times larger than the thermal conductivity of the laser. So another advantage of this structure is a carrier confinement. So, uh, and I uh, described that because the photon is also confined in the, this region. So, we can expect the effective uh, laser. And we also integrated the uh, input and output wavelength because the engine phosphide radiant is transparent for the laser wavelengths. So, so, the, the, uh, so this is structure of the electrically volume of deep lasers. Now, we try to fabricate the lateral P ion structure. Uh, this is the region and the active region of N engine phosphide. Radiant. And here is the output wavelength. The most profile couples to the effectively couples to the output wavelength. So uh, let me explain the fabrication process. Now, first, I will uh, draw the active region on 
then initiating any phosphide subject. And in this case, we use an enzyme and an arsenide separation array to reduce the leakage power. Then we look uh, back joint the enzyme uh, active region using the uh, enzyme phosphide array. Then uh, we have uh, implanted the silicon I for under these uh, conditions and the activation temperature is 650 degrees with three microns. And for beta doping, we use a thermal diffusion because uh, for in the case of the phosphide, the ion implantation very low uh, activation efficiency, such as less than 10 percent. So we use a thermal diffusion of the thing and we use these uh, conditions. Then we fabricate the dry etching with the air force. Then we uh, with uh, evaporate it and then we make uh, fabricate the air brick using the selective wet chemical etching. And this is the fabricated uh, uh, SE image of fabricated device. Here is a peak indium phosphide region, here is the active region, and any type of indium phosphide region. Here is the output web guys. Uh, this is a cross-sectional SEM image of the device. Uh, it is very difficult to see, but here it's a uh, three quantum wave active region and buried with the indium phosphide region. In this case, uh, the active region is 2.6 microns long and 0.3 microns wide and 0.15 microns high. And the active region is used by engine gun iron based uh, three quantum rays. And you can see the flat top surface and the smooth uh, air, air uh, dry, dry edge air force. And we also integrate that with the wave type. Uh, this is the IV characteristics of the IV, IV characteristics and IV characteristics of the room temperature shield operation of the device. Uh, this shows a cross to the session. Uh, we can achieve the special point of 7.8 micron. Uh, this is a record on value of room temperature shield uh, operation for any types of laser. And this is the red line shows the voltage curves. And this is a uh, wide range uh, IL curve, IV curve, and the uh, wall problem efficiency. Uh, first, uh, uh, after the threshold, the wall problem efficiency is about 6%. However, the uh, dramatically decreased. I think, uh, we think, we think that uh, this is due to the leakage kind to the uh, substrate. And uh, this shows the 3 dB line with and uh, peak wavelengths as a function of time near the threshold. And the uh, 3 dB line is uh, decreased with increasing the time, then uh, move to the phase six and increase the uh, 3 dB line. And, uh, uh, the carrier density is clamped after the uh, rating. So the, mm -hmm. the uh, rating wavelength, peak wavelength is the most constant. And the uh, threshold, uh, Q factor of the threshold value is uh, 32,000. So to uh, estimate the active region temperature, we can uh, measure the uh, rating wavelengths from 440 microwatts to 200 microwatts. Um, Due to the increase of the active regions, uh, the raising wavelengths is shifted to longer wavelength side. And compared with the pulse operation and the CW operation, we, uh, we can calculate the increase of the active region temperature. So uh, this is the result of the uh, increase of the active region temperature as a function of uh, the bias current. The way we increase to the bias current is 300 microamp there. The increase of the active region temperature is less than 20 Kelvin. So this is so this result shows that our device structure effectively suggests the active region temperature and resistance of the both P and N type region are not suggested. Of course we can we must decrease the uh, resistance, but good so serious problem. But this is a temperature dependent characteristic of the device. Uh, we achieved a 95 degrees uh, rating uh, with a CW operation. So finally, I will show you the dynamic response of the device. What? And the uh, key point of this uh, membrane structure is increase of the confinement factor. So we can achieve the uh, very high, uh, we can expect the high speed modulation. 
And this is small signal response of the bias current was changing from 25, 14, 18, and 200 micron. And we can achieve the maximum 3 dB bandwidth of 16.2 gigahertz. And this is a, a, a modulation current efficiency of the FR and the XDB. So the D factor was 53.8 gigahertz per square meter. Uh, this is the record value of the 10 types of the laser. So we can calculate the uh, simulator this small, uh, uh, small signal response. That we can achieve the dumping state of as a function of the square of the F part. The K factor, this is short, of the 0 0.2 nanosecond, this gives us the intrinsic F max of 44 gigahertz. Next, uh, I'll explain the uh, expected uh, modulation speed and the uh, energy cost of the, from the experimental result of the small signal response. Uh, this is a uh, much uh, modulation speed when we modulate this with uh, large signal response and the bias time as a function of the bias time. We use uh, this simple equation. Uh, bit rate is uh, 1.3 times the XVDB. So we can expect the uh, 10 gigabit modulation with 30 micron here and 20 gigabit modulation with 120 micron here. So we can calculate the uh, energy cost. This, uh, this is a bias movement and uh, bias, bias time over the uh, bit rate. So the energy cost was increased with increasing the bias time because the uh, uh, modulation speed is uh, uh, proportional to the square root of the bias time. However, we can achieve the 5.3 times per bit at the 12 gigabit uh, per second and the bias time plus 40. And 95 temperature per bit at uh, 74 gigabit per second, and the bias time was 80 micron there. Finally, I'll show you the dy dynamic response of the large signal modulation. Uh, due to the uh, uh, large uh, coupling loss between the photon crystal wave guide and fiber with uh, 10 decibels, we use the uh, uh, fiber amplifier to, to affix the and uh, so due to that uh, that coupling loss, uh, I was not clear, but we achieved that uh, uh, to the 12.5 gigabit per second uh, modulation. And uh, in this case, we did not use the 50 ohm termination. And the bias voltage was 1.6, and bias current was 100 micron. This type uh, means that uh, 40 ohm to the target. Energy cost. This is uh, almost the same as this uh, calculation. Uh, finally, I will show you our laser point. And this is shows uh, the special sign of the uh, here. And this is our one. And this is the EFP and the long wavelength pixels. Our laser is the same as the short bit uh, wavelength pixels. And this shows the energy cost as a function of the air. We uh, achieved uh, the laser uh, with a uh, 10 temperature. So, the laser constitutes a new and exciting class of lasers which uh, potentially uh, potential, uh, potential to employ data transmission for silicon systems. Thank you for your attention. Our uh, session is open for questions. Thanks for the uh, presentation. Thank you. Very thank you. Um, to comment on the output power, is the output power kind of running body speed on the application? Yeah. Um, and then maybe, what are the thoughts? What are the next steps in terms of integrating it, uh, you know, the arrays of lasers? Yeah, yeah. Uh, now, uh, our electrical driven laser was just uh, 10, 10 micro range. However, we previously, uh, uh, Fabricated the optical pumping devices. In that case, we achieved 100 microwatt. So when the uh, transition distance in the chip to chip was maybe 10 centimeters, so 100 microwatt is enough to achieve uh, to detect the, the 10 gigabit per second data. So may, uh, in, in, in that case, we can not clear why the difference between the output power of the optical pumping and electrical pumping, but we can. <laughs>
another 40 seconds. Ah, that. Uh, what are you planning to do next? So, well, first we tried the knowledge integration of the engine force side. And in this case, we uh, integrate the laser arrays and detector arrays. And uh, so, we achieve the, this shows the uh, current of the photo detector and the function of the injection current of the laser layer. This uh, directly is the uh, efficiency to the optical Electrical to optical and optical to electrical. We achieved about 10% uh, uh, efficiency. So this is a first try. Next try is uh, uh, we are trying the direct volume of silicon seams with a silicon photonics and the lasers. Now we are trying to the direct volume. It's the same way as the balwards. What about the driving from the electronics uh, improvement? This also, like I said, might be too many drivers. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure the drivers, but uh, in this case, we did not the termination, just uh, use the uh, air flow to the, from the PPC. Yeah. Uh, but we, I understand we must have the, uh, the, the resistance of this device is about one kilo. So maybe the problem is a defect. But yeah, but we do need to drive it at 50 ohms. I mean, that's like basically my question. You need to couple them very close to the systems, the yeah. transistors. But how, 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 what's no, the we did not, now we, in the experiment of the laboratory, we didn't use a driver. We just uh, directly uh, connected to the uh, people using the air probe and uh, right. the device. And now we did not use that uh, 50 ohm damage. Zinc is less than 0.2 or 0.3 microns, so we can control precisely the uh, distance. So we next try to uh, optimize the distance to the activation of the content. Okay, and then uh, let's give uh, thanks again to the speaker. So welcome everyone. Uh, I'm just one person, so I'm uh, Robert Kuhn. <laughs> um, I'm responsible for product marketing for the components business unit. Thanks for the invitation. I want to talk a bit about uh, you know the photonic integration that we see enabling the next generation networks. Um, and uh, it's good that I'm on the second day, so I can change my focus slightly. Um, I do want to give you an overview of the company. I just put in a few corporate slides because I realized 
know, not everyone's familiar with uh, all the telecom players and Julie did the introduction of Finisar. So I have sort of my own variation of the slide. Um, basically, we are, uh, the next slide, yeah. So basically, if you look at the revenue that we have, you know, we're basically, Finisar is the $1 billion company. Talked about yesterday, we're about 700 million per year. Um, we were, Clara was, was formed by the merger of Avonex and Bookham. You know, there were names maybe that some of you recognize. And we recently, uh, half a year ago, merged with Optex. So now, you know, sort of the number five and six player, we're the number two player in optical components. But obviously, there's a big uh, technology heritage, you know, more than 30 years, um, going back to Marconi, Norton Networks, and so on. Uh, we have three fabs in the UK, uh, and we play in different markets. Um, so three fabs in, in Europe. Um, we play in the optical communications market, um, and there really there are two two big areas that we focus on. One is the what we call the core optical network, where basically you use fifteen fifty DWDM signals to transmit light over you know, fiber optic cables, long distances, more than eighty kilometers. So we were playing in the transmit uh, section where we have the, the lasers, the modulators, the receivers. We have the pump lasers, we have the amplifiers. So all of that goes into the core of the network. Um, and then we also have playing the enterprise and data center market where really it's all about pluggable, pluggable transceivers. Um, you know, from 100 megabits still, you know, one gigabit today, still up to 100 gig now. There is all about different form factors. And then another area where we're you know, quite active is industrial and consumer. So we have a lot of high power lasers you know, for material processing, uh, you know, all the welding machines, but also just going into consumer applications. You know, optical mice, for example, are using our pixels. We have our pixels in uh, you know, active optical cables for consumer applications, like USB 3 cables are now coming out, the HDMI cables are coming out. Um, the lasers in them, fiber optic cables, or uh, in the Sony uh, lab book, you will find uh, in the Vio lab book, you'll find optical cable in the latest version. Um, so there's a lot of uh, you know exciting uh, applications for optics in the consumer space as well. Um, that's kind of just showing you sort of the, the breadth of the, the products. Um, anyway, I just want to give you sort of a quick introduction to, to kind of position where we are. What, what is key for us really is uh, and a lot of the companies, you know, the planet space, they'll need to emphasize that it's vertical integration. You know, I mean, it all starts really at the, with the underlying technology and the wafer fabs. Uh, you know, indium phosphide, gallium arsenide, lithium nulbate, we have MEMS liquid crystal, gallium nitride. These are all the enabling technologies. You know, and without those, you know, the, the, the pyramid would be, you know, missing something. Um, and that's kind of where we, well, core differentiators. That's why, even as of Claro now, we are still have five wafer fabs in overall. We have two in Japan, uh, three in Europe. And overall, we're quite, you know, material agnostic. I mean, it's really, for me, it's about using the, the best material for the, or the right material for the job. You, know, you don't want to be stuck with one platform and trying to do everything with just one platform. And then it's about, you know, putting it into packages and, uh, you know, enabling you know, new module form factors. So when I, when I look at photonic integration, what is it about? Well, one is that it really only wins if, if you are able to get equal or better attributes to, uh, to a discrete or hybrid solution. You know, it's not about integrating for integration's sake, you know, and, and there are many examples where basically you have, you have good possibilities, but don't compromise. You know, you cannot compromise on the lowest common denominator just so that you, you can integrate. Um, overall, at the end of the day, it's all about bandwidth, you know, higher bandwidth, lower power dissipation, smaller size, and overall lower power dollar per transmitted bit. You know? And um, and there's always kind of those myths, you know, that was, you know, indium phosphide, gallium arsenide, PLC. Now everybody's really hyped up about, about silicon photonics. You know, and if, if you don't have, you know, if you don't play silicon photonics, you, 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 the stock gets beaten up. And, you know, it's it's a myth. It's 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 already here today. We're doing photonic integration today, but really, it's it's a combination of various building blocks. You know, and obviously, indium phosphide is everywhere because we use it for lasers today. We use it, you know, for modulators. Um, but at the same time, you know, we have lithium nitride still playing, and people have said you know, ten years ago that lithium nitride is on its way out. We still see it today. 
So for us, it's really about you know combining best-in-class building blocks and doing hybrid packaging where, where applicable. Um, this is sort of a variant or variation on the slide that you know we've, we've seen before. I just wanted to quickly, quickly show you how we see the whole market uh, effectively for, for lasers, if you will. This is showing your volume in units per year. This is sort of transmission distance. And typically in the telecom space, you know, when we do long, long reach applications, we talk about you know, 100,000 units, 100,000 of units per year. And again, you go like 80 kilometers or longer. Um, on the data home side, it's like you know, tens of, um, tens of uh, uh, millions of transceivers you know, for, for, the, for the long reach. Um, and then you know, the shorter reach is, 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 is more, it's more on the order of like 100 million. But then, as you go to shorter distances, you have all these you know, consumer applications, uh, the intra-chip, uh, you know, memory to, to DRAM and so on, where basically the volumes are, are very big. You know, I mean, today we're shipping like one million pixels per, per week, you know, just into those consumer applications. And that's kind of where, you know, some of the you know, silicon photonics and pixels play. Today I want to focus a bit more on, on edge emitters and the uh, for slide. This is just like one slide showing where all these you know, consumer applications are. So if I look at the, the telecom space, and it's funny how time flies, but it's already a year and a half ago almost. Um, really, we have traditionally when we look at telecom, you know, we're talking at phone factors uh, that are MSA compliant, like 300 pin MSA transponders that were used for you know 10 gig. 168 pin now from the 100k transponder. It was all about high performance, long reach, and uh, you know lower volumes, so tens of thousands. Datacom it was all about pluggable form factors, low cost, uh, you know short reach up to 80 kilometers, you know, um, and then high, higher volumes, you know, hundred thousands per year, millions per year, um, and uh, you know I kind of came up with that you know. Metrocom in the middle, where it was now about pluggable, good enough performance, and you know, reach you know, up to say 600 or 800 kilometers. And it wasn't really clear, you know, kind of what the volumes would be. But you know, when we look at it today, what's really happening is that we have a kind of a new telecom, if you will, where you know, again, pluggability becomes very key. Um, it's still about high performance, but you know. People are willing to compromise. You know, it's about what what can you really achieve, and we're now talking about using coherent detection down to uh, eight kilometer reach and putting coherent into pluggable, and that's really something I want to talk about today. And it's about hundred thousands per year. Um, we're focusing here on, on indium phosphide, and one of the reasons is that it's it's a key technology that's very, very mature. I mean, can, I cannot overemphasize how mature that technology is. We use it for the tunable lasers, we use it for modulators, we use it for receivers, and really, you know, there are tens of thousands of laser shipped. Uh, we we co-package modulators and uh, laser together. Uh, that's all in the background today of the Tribal Peak Network. And we can do uh, long-term cost reduction. So you know we're one of the big lithium ion players, but in our 10G transponders, we have uh, all but replaced the lithium ion date with indium phosphide. Um, we're we're using uh, the same thing in uh, tunable uh, XFP, uh, and it allows us really high levels of integration. I'm going to erase some slides here to show you just you know, how it looks. You know, lasers. You can do you know basically. Here's one focus. We integrate it with, uh, with uh, the modulator here. So here, the laser section, you have the uh, new phosphide modulator section. So you can put it all on a single chip if you want. That's kind of what we're using in, in some of the pluggable transceivers today. We can do uh, waveguide pin photodiodes. So in our coherent receivers or in other receivers, we use uh, uh, waveguide pins. Um, we do wafer testing, you know, that's, that's one of the key areas for us. And we have done a lot of you know, research projects where we've done uh, AWGs and the phosphide and so on. So there are all, all kinds of possibilities. 
uh, some, some other building blocks here. So we can do MMI couplers. We have basically a whole library of things, functionalities we can do. Uh, vertical tables are quite important to spot size converters to get to the right uh, mode profiles. Um, to give you sort of an example, um, it's, it's all it's still on three inch actually. So that's kind of interesting. Like even on the Vixel stuff on Game Arsenal, we're still doing everything in three inch. People ask, why are you doing that? Well, we can put 100,000 uh, uh, pixels on a three-inch wafer, you know, and it means that you know we, we really don't need that many uh, that many wafers to do our you know one million per uh, per big shipment. And um, so here in any phosphide, when we get the the, the, um, the integrated chips where we have a laser and a 10 G modulator, um, really what, what's going in power tuning by XFP, we can put a thousand of those uh, 10 G uh, chips on one wafer. You know, so that's what 10 terabit for uh, for one three-inch wafer, uh, and we tested on on wafer. You know, so we were able to, to probe each wafer and measure each single of those 1,000 chips you know, for this area. And, and then you can look at the wafer map uh, at um, on this new phosphide wafer, similar to what we do on Vixels. And Vixels also one of the advantages is that you can measure them uh, and probe them uh, on the wafer. And we're doing something similar on any phosphide because we have integrated wavefront TVs and monitors at the right point. So we can actually probe the laser and measure its performance. And um, yeah, you see very few fails. I think the yield here on this one is like 96% uh, when you measure it at the wavefront level. Obviously, you still have to package it and then make sure that you know you, you can have assembly value losses. But that's that's really one of the key areas um, is being able to measure it on, on chip. So to give you some examples of uh, what we have done, and you know, there were some comments yesterday about you know, things being mature. I mean, again, I cannot overemphasize how mature that technology is uh, for 10 gig and also for 40 gig. Um, as an example here, what we're doing for 40 gig, we're co-packaging, um, we're co-packaging the laser um, with the modulator. So we have an uh, indium phosphide uh, laser here, and then. This section here in the butterfly package is a RZD QPS kit, a modulator chip. So then this has been shipping for uh, for a couple of years now, pretty 40 gig uh, DQPSK, and we're co-packaging. Uh, the modulator uh, on, on a single chip. That's what we do for the Tunable FP because we need to do that for, for space and power for space reasons. For example, on the on the 300 pin 10 gig uh, transponder, we're still co-packaging because we get better performance with that. And really, from a cost perspective, it's not uh, it's not it's not uh, cheaper to do it on a single chip. Um, we have done um, the race of 10 on a single chip. Um, so we have chips where we have 10 of those, if you go Mark Sander, lasers on a single chip, or where we have four, four chips. So here we do like a, one chip with four lasers, four by 28, uh, on the single uh, transmitter. Again, this is, uh, um, again, gives you, gives you 100 uh, transmitters here with 100 gigabits each. So again, like 10 terabit per, per wave. So the one thing I really want to today kind of uh, focus is how we're enabling 100 gig coherent with electronic integration. So if you look at 100 gig coherent today, uh, it's really shipping in this uh, MSA form factor. You know, so it's a 168 pin MSA module, and it's really great. It's a, you know, five by seven inch OIF compliant. Uh, we, it's, a, it's a tunable laser, 50 gigahertz grid, and you know, we've talked about spectral efficiency yesterday. Um, and, um, and reach. You know, so we have demonstrated more than uh, 3,000 kilometers of, uh, of you know, transmission distance with that, and it's all really high performance. And it's available today, and you know, basically those modules start, started shipping around the middle of, of last year. And it's again, it's available availability of the DSP, um, and uh, you know this is this is all good. It's, it's ramping, and we're excited about that. Um, and here, I mean, this is you know the picture you saw, saw is basically from, from the Opnex group, from the satellite, if you will. And uh, this was a demo they did uh, back in, uh, in July, basically transmitting 3,300 3, kilometers between uh, Amsterdam and uh, the CERN in Geneva. 
But if you look at what's what's next, uh, and in particular looking at the metro, where we're, again we're looking at distances of a couple hundred kilometers, um, we're seeing something else, uh, you know, enabling that space, and that's really going to plug the interfaces. You know, we we have we, we're trying to do this. We're trying to do and we're developing specifically a digital CFP where we take most of the functionality that we have in the MSA module and putting it into a 32-watt CFP module. And then also, um, the, the, the other option is basically for the customer to put the DSP that's inside that module onto their line card. And then we're looking at an analog uh, CFP2, potentially even a CFP4 down the road. Um, and if you look at what, uh, what, what it takes to, to do that, well, you need three building blocks, three, three key optical building blocks to, to get into a transponder. One is you need a tunable laser. The tunable laser has to have a really good face mode profile, low line width for, for coherent detection because, you know, again, if, if the line width is too big or too high, too much noise, uh, you cannot compensate for all the chromatic dispersion and the polarization mode dispersion. Um, so what we have done is we have developed a, uh, a what we call a micro IPLA, a laser basically that has a narrow line width and it's very compact and low power dissipation. So here we're looking at a line width below 400 kilohertz for the table. And then, you know, the, this is a mode map that basically shows you, um, I don't know, well, I mean, it, <laughs> it shows you basically uh, the, the mode location as a function of tuning current. I'm not talking, I haven't had a chance to put in slides to talk about how the laser works, but basically you have a tuning current that you have to apply to two mirrors, uh, and then you plot the, the, the basically the wavelength as a function of those tuning currents for those two, two mirrors, you get those mode maps. Um, you know, those nice lines indicate that you have good laser operation and this is basically at, at high temperature. Uh, so we're happy about that, <laughs> that plot. But uh, more importantly, you want to make sure that the cross wavelength is really at, at the low line width. So that, that's one key enabling building block. Second one is the coherent receiver. And what we have done here is we have taken uh, again, there is for the for the current generation, there is a, a, a standard uh, OIF uh, form factor for coherent receivers. And what we're doing here um, is we're we're using a combination of bulk optics, you know, for the polarization beam splitter, a combiner, uh, and, and, and for the polarization rotation. And then we have inium phosphide chips in here, two of them, that do the 90 degree hybrid. You know, so they basically uh, combine the uh, the local oscillator signal and the, the local oscillator and the signal and do the 90 degree hybrid in there. And then we have the wave factor as part of part of that chip. And then you have the TIAs. So, so you know this is what we're we're doing today and we've done for a while. It's part of our 40 gig and 100 gig kind of series. But for the uh, for the next generation that I talked about for the pluggable we're taking this here and, and shrinking it further. I mean this is already pretty small um, this is about, you know, I think, like one third or one quarter of the OF footprint already. And we need to, today, we need to add an adapter board to make it compliant with the, with the standard. And then, um, you know, for the next gen, we're taking that and taking that further. That's kind of summarizing it really here. So, what we're doing, so what we're using today, so again, in the, in the transponder that I showed you with uh, you know, three and a half thousand kilometer reach, um, we're using uh, two lasers uh, and one lithium novate modulator and a coherent receiver. Um, what we're doing for the next gen is really taking those two lasers, and you don't need two lasers, you just need one laser with high enough output power uh, that can then do the tab use, be used for both the transmit and for the local oscillator thing. And we're co-packaging that with an indium phosphide modulator uh, into this uh, BOSA or intervention. And then on the, on the uh, receiver, we're we're shrinking that receiver. Here is the, the adapter board, by the way. So we're shrinking that and you know, removing the adapter board. And really putting that into you know, both a digital CFP that needs to have less than 32 watts of power dissipation and into an analog CFP that has less than uh, 12 watts of power dissipation. So that you know you can see that basically you know for the optics we have a power budget of 12 watts, which also means that you know we need to have low enough VP and uh, low enough. <coughs> Uh, appropriate drivers to, to get to the low power dissipation, and then uh, the remaining 20 watts are basically for the for the DSP and other electronics module. 
Yeah, and this is this is the uh, this is the chip, by the way. Uh, this is the enum phosphide chip, the 108 pm PPSK chip that goes into those modules. So this is a, a real picture of it. Um, Fortunately, I, I cannot really show you some detailed detail measurements because you know, the details are, are uh, quite sensitive. But you know, I have no problem showing you sort of the inboard and, and the two arms, the center arm, and the complete So, you know, if I want to just sort of summarize what's happening, I mean, you know, the traditional telecom devices are really moving towards pluggable form factors. You know, we, at 10G, we saw the move from 300 pin to 300 pin hybrid. A co package to Kinobex FP. <coughs> Key drivers really are low power dissipation, <coughs> higher phase play density, and lower overall cost. It doesn't mean that you know, the component itself has to have lower cost, but just the whole system, it's looking at the overall system and the operating cost of the system. And you know, hybrid and micro packaging is really key. You know, it's, it's about using the best of class building blocks. And you, know, you cannot, again, I'm repeating myself, but you cannot uh, compromise for integration sake. Um, and we do see Indian Phosphate as a key enabler really for the next generation of coherent pluggable interface. You know, it's about having a narrow line with laser um, that can be POCO packaged with a 100 gig uh, Indian Phosphate modulator, 4 by 2, 28 gig, uh, and then getting into the 12 watt power target for the, for the analogs. Um, that's, that's all that I had. And I did, uh, well, I did take a picture of some labels that I had here. <laughs> Lego, so I'm a big Lego fan as well, or my kids are at least. And then um, there are two articles that just came out. Um, one, there, um, there was a Lightwave article in the Lightwave magazine, um, uh, talking about pretty much what I just talked about, about that uh, the form factor. Um, so you could probably find that, or if you go to OFC, there will be half in there. There's another article in Compound Semiconductor that just came out to this week. That talks about some of the consumer applications. If you're interested in that, I wrote, um, wrote about that as well. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. No, there's, there's a lens, there's free space. Um, and uh, I can just go back here. My apologies for not, uh, not explaining it clearly. But the, um, so the chip, the chip is, so this is a standard mode uh, uh, modulator chip. And it has basically lenses here. So if you look at this picture, I can blow it up for you later, but you know, the, the, the tunable laser is on this carrier. Yeah. And then there's free space, and it goes into this. Uh, into this much isolated between that. Long yeah, long they'll, 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 long actually, long I don't long. even. Yeah, I think there will be an isolator. I'm pretty certain that they're okay. nice okay. But um, yeah, th so this co-packaging is is, is is really one of the, sort of the key uh, building blocks that we have. I mean, we, we have the option of putting it on a single chip yeah. or of co-packaging it. But in fact, for the for the hundred gig, for example, if you want to put it on a single chip. You would have to compromise. Well, it's not tough. You would have to compromise on performance because actually, what it turns out that if you look at your crystal orientation, you know the laser wants to be in one orientation and the modulator wants to be in another orientation for best performance. So if you put them on the on the same uh, same chip, you either have to make the laser worse performing or you have to make the modulator worse performing. You know, and by having it co-packaged, you can have the laser in the ideal orientation and the modulator in the ideal orientation. The second question that. Uh, Narrow line space laser. Your laser intrinsically is not narrow line space laser. You use a battery in writing to write the, the that all. Yeah. So, so traditionally, for like 10, 10G applications, nobody really worried about line width. Right. And also, we had like a couple of megahertz of line width, and yeah. it was awful. Yeah. That's right. um, then when when we went to 40 gig, 40 gig DQPSK and so on, um, it started to get you know those phase you know you know. Base modulation is important there. Yeah, uh, so base information side to get more, uh, be more conscious about what you're doing with your drive electronics. So at that point, you have to start look to look at your drive electronics, make sure that you're not introducing any noise, you know, okay. through the drive electronics on the laser. Um, and then, um, so so that was a one, 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 one learning step, if you will. And then for the for the coherent, 
basically what you need to traditionally people use external cavity lasers. That's right. You know, so if you look at uh, you know um, Intel's or M cores laser, basically they have external cavity that go to 100 kilohertz. Um, but obviously we don't want to do that because it's sort of preventing us from integrating it. You know, That's having right. external cal cavity it's hard to integrate things. So uh, we wanted to find a way to get to the neural language of sort of a single chip. So doing and effectively we're doing the incremental design. So we've, we've made our cavity a bit longer. We've changed sort of the, we've improved our gain to make the laser more efficient. Um, we've done something through the mirrors to make them more efficient. And that's kind of how you get to the sub 500 kilo. Okay. Yeah. Um, I actually don't know. I think it's mostly DC. I think it's mostly DC and then, uh, RF is mostly by by design, but there, you know there's some some kind of problem. Um, I think at one stage you said you were packaging um, laser chips with Indian cost. Uh, sorry, with uh, with an average uh, and then you uh, you also have a packaging problem. Indian cost is there, uh, I mean, for, for the Indian for the cost by the chips, is there any issue to prevent them being really like uh, it's not really hard to make them really or you know, or wavelengths to handle the software of the Indian cost by the cost of 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 the cost
and there are a number of, of centers. We have uh, a number of institutes at the university, including our Dino and Electron Microscopy Center. So basically, the main thing is uh, if you take standards technology, in the phosphate technology, you have uh, rich devices, you have a gain, and you have a certain white length. If we now use photonic crystals instead, uh, we can we will have some slowdown in the light of the max uh, which will increase the gain and in principle maybe we can reduce the uh, device length. And also having this in hand we might also make the device more energy efficient because the amount of material that you need to invert is so kind of our hero device that we are working towards is, is uh, this conceptual uh, mode light laser where we have a, a slow light waveguide which allows us to shrink the device for a given repetition frequency. Uh, in this case, of course, needs to be broadband. So actually, a lot of the work we have done has been to try and look at uh, broadband SOAs in photonic crystals. And we have some messages based on, on this, uh, but this is uh, basically one of the key uh, things that we are, are, are trying to see. Well, what does it take to, to be able to do it? All right. Um, so again, it's the slow lights. Uh, we have quite some theory uh, work in this, uh, but we also have some experiments I'll uh, tell you about. And from this, we have realized some challenges that uh, basically the main message are related to. All right, so as probably uh, all of you, well, most of you know, uh, if we have a sonic crystal, we have some dispersion diagram, and here at the band edge, we have that the uh, group velocity is uh, close to zero, so we have a high group index. And one way of uh, visualizing this is by the Krauss model here that you have uh, back and forth scattering and, and longer interaction length, which is then why we get the, the high gain and high nonlinear interactions in, in general. And uh, yeah, that was very simple. Uh, in order to to predict device performance, uh, you can of course do the full fledged the 3D, FDTD, uh, including all the material dynamics and so on. Um, this is quite powerful. We are also doing it uh, this work here. But uh, if you want to do real devices, long devices, you cannot really uh, simulate these big structures. At least not if you want to change any parameters. So. Uh, what we generally do is to do the expansion in terms of block modes and then uh, expand the theory based on that. And if you do that, you end up with some classical expressions so where you have a gain, uh, you have some material parameters, you have inversion, and then you have the uh, group index, uh, so the, yeah, the group index enhancement, so if you can increase this, you can increase the gain. And we also have a confining factor of contribution because the mode, of course, depending on where we operate, it will spread out into the form of the crystal and we need to take that into so this is a simple model uh, for CW excitation, uh, where we also neglect the scattering between forward and back and propagating blood modes. It's actually an important thing, which I'll come back. All right, so just to what to expect. I guess I need to stay here. Uh, this is uh, taking an example, one corner well, one millimeter device length is what we typically do. You have a population inversion versus position uh, for different pumping, and this is assuming optical pumping. So low pumping, of course, you have no inversion. Uh, a little bit higher, you have the depletion at the edges, as we know for normal amplifiers. And for high pumping, we have the, the uh, uh, inversion and you have gain. And if you look at this uh, as function of wavelength, so this is then uh, looking at transmission, so we can think of this as amplifier, we have the, uh, the band edge of the photonic crystal here, and what we can see, this is the green one here, is the, uh, the loss. So the loss is, of course, also enhanced by this uh, multiple scatter. Now, if we put in the gain material, and for now, neglect the slow light enhancement, then, of course, we have enhancement of the uh, absorption, that's here, and then when we have the gain, we, we also get the uh, well, anyway, it, it runs around the, the intrinsic material parameters, of course, and we have a, a certain difference for uh, the non slow light enhanced. And if we add the slow light enhancement, we can see that, that uh, at the bandage, it's supposed to be the slow light, we have an enhancement of the gain, but we also have enhancement of the losses. So if you want to do anything non linear, for instance, with uh, signal processing, then of course you can exploit this uh, entire range. 
All right, so uh, this is a subset of my normal slides. Uh, it's a little bit fast, so you can say it on the questions. Uh, we've done quite a few experiments. Uh, so we are using photonic crystal uh, waveguides to keep one millimeter long. Um, we can add different uh, active materials. So compared to what we saw from NCT, we typically use uh, uniform material. I'll get back to that also. Um, and uh, we also use uh, quaternion materials, so that means we do have these uh, heating issues. Oops. Uh, one uh, trick that we are using quite a lot is um, to use these uh, mode converters. This is something taken from uh, Tarnas research. So uh, you have to start with the waveguide, and to couple into that, you have a huge loss unless you do something. So have, by having these tables, we can actually go from, from the red curve here to the, to the black one. So we have a, a quite significant uh, improvement in transmission. And another thing, we also get rid of the reflection you normally have. So here, the fact that parallel modes, if you don't have these, uh, you can uh, more or less uh, get rid of those. So if you want to look at amplifiers, of course, you need to, to do that. So we have a decent uh, transmission. This is for one millimeter long. All right, so uh, because of this uh, heating issue, we are doing um, optical pump, or pulsed optical pumping, either at 980 or at uh, 800. Uh, so we, we pump from the, from the side here with this lens the lens. We have the chip sitting here. We can look at it from the top, and we can have uh, input and output of these uh, pumps. Again, we are, we are playing around with materials. Uh, we have done 10 quantum dots, 1 quantum dot, and 3 quantum dots. So, and anything in between, more or less. Uh, so uh, if we measure on the devices, we can take a, a, a device where we don't use these motor expanders, then of course we have the thermal cavity, and from that we will get some uh, fringes. If we illuminate it from the top, we will have continuous emission. We can look at the fringe spacing, and from that we can uh, extract the group index. What we see here is uh, around 40 is a, is a typical value. Uh, it's quite difficult actually to go significantly higher, uh, basically because of, of the problems with scattering, so high losses. We can also uh, look at the spectral emission from a, a real amplifier, so with, with the, uh, with the uh, mode expanders. And in this case, uh, for different pumping intensity, we can of course see that it increases. And the important thing here is that the emission from the quantum well is, is broad. This quantum well is yes. Uh, it's broad uh, emission background and at the band edge is what we, where we see the emission. This of course doesn't tell us if we have gain. So we have looked at this. So this was the purpose of this work was to prove that we actually had this thermal enhancement. So if we do the <coughs> look at the spectrum as function of of uh, pump length, we can uh, just take our simple uh, formulas for, for what to expect. And from that, we can uh, extract what the gain coefficient is. So this is an example. We have a function of wavelength and uh, increasing uh, pumping length. And from this, we can extract uh, a gain curve. So this, is, this point is at low pumping and at high pumping. So each of these points is taken from a curve fix. Okay, but not perfect. Oops. So the key point to note here is that we have around 30 per centimeter, which is more than what we would get from a single well. So that kind of is a proof that we, we do have a solar unit, but not by the factor of maybe 10 that we would have expected. So not, uh, and that's of course partly because our common wells is not performing as, as nice as they should be when we have all the holes filled full and so on. Anyway, we're quite happy uh, with this. Uh, so. So in principle it works, but uh, in practice there are quite a lot of issues when you try to do this. Um, so this is an example of doing from the top of uh, these photonic crystal waveguides, um, and here at different pumping lengths. And what we can see is that we have these uh, bright spots here. Um, and of course, there can be two things. It could be simply that we have some scatterings that uh, scatter upwards, or it could be that we have uh, a laser. There. And um, in practice, we actually do have laser, 
lasers, and that's of course a problem. If you want to make an amplifier, and you have lasing around from the cavity, that will basically slam your carrier densities and give you problems. So this is a significant uh, thing that you you have to uh, worry about. That is, is in fact lasing. Uh, some of my colleagues uh, did some detailed uh, micro peel measurements of this, where they basically looked at the light and uh, so on, and, and they saw that it is indeed. This is the system, not just because it's scattered now. So this is something that uh, and, uh, you can extract some localization length if you, if you like lasers, you don't know where are. So this is uh, something that, it actually doesn't help just to be very good at fabrication. It, of course it does help to some extent, but the better fabrication you do, the more well-defined bandits you actually have. So a very small uh, defect will, will then actually give you a fairly high Q cavity. So this is uh, something you have to, to worry about you know, these kind of uh, amplifiers. Another thing that is a little bit more fundamental, actually, um, is um, if you take the, uh, so this is an example for, for a theory, theory for crow structure. Uh, and now we are using the static density of states instead. So high static density of states basically means uh, a low group velocity. If you take this uh, structure and um, Calculates the uh, so states, you, you find that uh, in the ideal case we have very high values, so again, very low group losses. But uh, the, if we start to add losses, then uh, it, it drops. And that was maybe not so surprising to us. Uh, basically, you have that the reflections don't add up. Uh, the reflections that give us a slow light they don't add up. But uh, in, in a fraction, uh, there's actually no difference between gain or loss. So by adding loss, we get the same issues. That you actually cannot get the same uh, the same uh, slow light effect. So this is this, and this is intrinsic. Uh, I mean, if you have a, a, a uniform structure, for which then then you cannot get around this. It's not a it's not a huge problem. Uh, so if we just skip this one and take this. Um, Graph here. This is an example where we show the group index versus frequency. So again, we have a, a bandage here. Uh, and now do it for different uh, imaginary parts of the tracks index. So if you have almost no uh, no gain or loss, then you do get a very high group index. This is theory, so 500 is easy and uh, perhaps it's closest. But the, the minute we add more and more gain, so the, the yellow one here would be a quite a significant amount of gain we get a limit limitation around 40. But uh, if we use low gain material, which is what we want to do anyway, so we don't have to spend a lot of uh, current on inverting it, so quantum dots and other things, we can indeed, uh, even with this fundamental limitation, we need to indeed get uh, an acceptable uh, group index enhancement. So actually, this limit is in practice not worse than the uh, disorder that I showed you before. All right. Uh, other issues, I think these are addressed very well by the, by the team. So heating is, is uh, an issue. If you want to do this modular laser, that was our hero device, you also need to, to be able to do tailored tailor dispersion. And uh, so we want to, if you don't do anything clever, the, the grouping that you get versus wave number is basically uh, a, a just increasing the curve like this, so you have a huge uh, dispersion. Uh, group uh, <coughs> velocity dispersion. Uh, and what we would want in practice is, is a, it's a flat part here. In, in, in practice, but in theory, this is actually doable. So we are using a method called topology optimization, as a reference here, uh, to um, come up with structures that basically can give us uh, not whatever structure you want, because of course there's a physical limitation, but uh, you can indeed get very nice and flat uh, passage. Flat in practice, uh, fabricating this, I don't have any scales on any of this, but this is indeed very difficult and uh, uh, 5 to 10 nanometer uh, accurate inaccuracies changes this completely. So this is something we're working on to, to realize. Uh, we have done some work, but it has not been included in, in devices yet. Uh, of course, you have surface free combination and the electrical pumping. Uh, also. Um, we just saw the very nice work from NTT. Uh, they have, of course, uh, 
solve many of, of the issues uh, and the work we do with DTU, we, we want to, of course, to go uh, along similar lines. Uh, what they're doing here is, is what we would call a traditional bird headers project. Uh, and we, since our project is basic science, we want to be able to, to swing it even further down to, to wires and dots and so on. So we do a slightly different approach. So uh, what you see here uh, is uh, one wells in, in, embedded in, in this uh, this tiny crystal waveguide. And in this case, it's uh, actually misaligned a bit. So uh, these are, in practice, not working. The way we do this is uh, instead of doing the bird, which is in many ways a good, a good way of doing it, we're doing selective area growth instead. So we are passing the way for before the growth uh, and then uh, doing the selective growth. So in practice, we do uh, EV lithography with HSQ, which can go into our MVP reactor, then we do some uh, in situ etching in the reactor before the growth. Uh, and that's the way we realize the uh, structure. So uh, this is an example. We have wells and we have uh, wires. So we can, uh, this is uh, fairly recent work. Um, and uh, well, it emits nicely, but uh, we, we don't have uh, lasing for this yet. This is very good. This also allows us to use the phosphides uh, in the same reasoning as, as MCT, much better than what uh, All right, we also have some work on looking at electrically pumping. I think probably out of time now. Um, so here we can see uh, we're looking at different geometries. So this is uh, similar to the first uh, electrically pumped devices being made by Young PV. This is a bird header structure, and this is one where we, we don't do any uh, passing of the of the active material. And we can follow the, the in this case, whole current, and you have the recombination taking place where you have the modes, or you have some way that's leakage. So all the holes going to the inside here, that would be leakage, and we do similar for the other structures. So it's this uh, very structure is, is by far uh, superior and the way to go. All right, so this was simply to show you some of the activities that we, we have in this center, what we're working on. Um, so we have quite some, some theoretical investigations on this, and we have also made this first uh, demonstration that you actually do get the, the slow light and hand gain. So we are quite happy with this. There are many issues. Uh, it's a very difficult technology to work with. Um, we still need to do the electricity pumping uh, and the selective growth. And there are these more or less fundamental limits that, that uh, will, will limit what we can ultimately do. But uh, anyway, I hope you got a flavor of what we do. Thank you. Standard session of solvers. Um, so, yeah. Well, actually, so I have done quite a lot of mode clubbing. Uh, so, of course, if you have the contacts, then it's easy. Then you just go as far as the section and then you get the mode clubbing. The, um, until, until we have that, then, of course, uh, if you take it one well and then you see the, the, uh, the holes, then that will actually also have a fairly fast. Uh,
intensity, and so does the, the, the wave guide. Oh, you're okay. You're thinking of using this as a more logging mechanism? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that, that's an interesting question, and actually, we, a big part of what we do is also looking at switches and nonlinear interactions and so on in, in virtual cavities. So that might be. I mean, you could easily imagine stuff like that that you could use uh, real nonlinearities as as more logging mechanisms. That's, that's definitely true. Uh, what we have looked at so far, I don't think any of them would do that. But uh, but it is it's, uh, we're doing at switching India. Uh, I mean again a bit like the NTT, uh, but uh, multiple structures and so on, so you can scale. I'm interested in attractive area growth. But how narrow can you keep uh, growth? Yes, okay. Uh, I don't know. Uh, okay, so um, openings typically. Oops. Openings are typically. Um, uh, okay, we're using HSQ, and HSQ is a material that uh, is a negative uh, resist that basically becomes glass like when you. Exposed it, which is very nice because it can go into our growth. But it actually has problems with residuals, um, and especially since we need to cover the photonic crystal path, we do, we do need to have some significant path on the side. So in practice, uh, 30, 50 nanometer limitation. The good part. Do I have a number? Uh, the good part. Is the good part. I don't know if it's possible to see, but uh, when you do the etching in situ etching, you actually get the triangular profile. So you can easily, and, and we are doing that, and we are trying to do ten hundred and so on. Uh, you can do wires, which is what our aim is, of course. Uh, so I think it is definitely feasible to to do that. But the pitch of the wires will of course be limited by your lithography. So. Uh, you will maybe not be able to have many wires for each uh, standing pattern. Uh, I mean, you can definitely do one that's trivial, uh, but uh, having many is, is limited by, by the fact that you need to use this. Okay, so uh, let's start the next speaker again. Talk is by myself, and the uh, uh, title is a uh, hybrid three by on uh, silicon uh, virtual cavity laser for silicon photonics. Basically, it will be about the uh, laser and the uh, detector based on the double and gradient meter structure. Okay, so uh, this is an uh, outline of my talk. Um, first, uh, I will uh, briefly introduce the, the background of uh, this work. And then uh, I will uh, introduce what is a hybrid first uh, capital laser, and uh, I will talk about uh, the novel performances that can be achieved by uh, employing the gray emitter. And I will summarize my talk. <clears throat> so uh, the lasers for uh, short distance of the interconnect, as uh, the uh, Dr. Uh, the Shinji Machu introduced, 
uh, people are requiring a smaller auto power for a short distance of uh, 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 for uh, lasers. So roughly uh, 10 petajoules per bit uh, is uh, energy consumption is required for on-chip integration and uh, around 100 petajoules per bit for off-chip integration. And for each laser modulation speed uh, is required to be at least higher than the 10 gigabit. And the output power uh, is required to be uh, more than the 10 uh, microwatt considering uh, the, the overall system design. So um, for a, uh, this um, applications, we can think about that this kind of existing technologies. So uh, some evidence laser uh, based on uh, edge imaging uh, structure. And uh, this is our approach, also hybrid approach, but here light amplification in vertical direction. And this is a conventional pixel structures. And uh, and this is a uh, photonic crystal laser, and this is a photonic crystal laser, and micro disc laser. Um, today, I would like to uh, focus about uh, this uh, pixel based structure about employing this gray emitter. So, what kind of uh, advantages can be obtained by? Uh, uh, employing this great meter, that will be uh, the main point of uh, this talk. So uh, this uh, simple uh, graph uh, gives us a, uh, some uh, the parameter uh, the domain uh, that we are working with. So x-axis is uh, modulation speed and y-axis is uh, uh, energy consumption per bit uh, demonstrated by uh, several uh, laser structures. So um, from entities, uh, output power consumption is around 10 petajoule, and I learned that even lower. Um, and the modulation uh, speed is uh, from uh, the previous paper. Uh, yeah, uh, it was uh, 10 uh, gigabit for electric pump, but it can be even higher than that. And uh, for uh, the pixel uh, from the cold press group, um, output power. And the modulation speed is close to 40 gigabit. But from the TU Berlin group, um, average consumption is around 50 petajoule per bit, and the output power level is at 1.1. So, uh, for uh, off-chip uh, interconnection, maybe uh, the big cell uh, could be the right solution, considering uh, output power and the good modulation speed, and also. Uh, small uh, small uh, energy consumption, but uh, on chip integration uh, seems that the photon crystal based uh, nano uh, laser would be the solution. So, uh, so far, especially in the short wavelength, uh, the uh, pixels, many efforts to uh, the, uh, put into uh, the increasing uh, the modulation speed of laser. So, um, uh, various uh, ideas have been implemented to reduce the extrinsic speed and also uh, regarding the, uh, the intrinsic speed, also many uh, design ideas have been uh, employed. Uh, one of the things is uh, if you can handle this uh, the photon cavity lifetime, then actually you can handle uh, both uh, this relaxation oscillation frequency and also this uh, damping factor. In this way, um, you can considerably improve uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, the modulation speed of uh, pixel laser, and also uh, the reducing uh, the cavity length is another way to increase uh, the speed response. And uh, by using the grading meter, actually we can further improve uh, these two parts. So uh, in our uh, proposed uh, structure, um, uh, we employ uh, this uh, grading meter uh, that is formed on the silicon layer of. Uh, SOI wafer. So in this way, um, we can uh, amplify light in vertical direction. But when you insert the, uh, this uh, normal waveguide, then the output uh, can be uh, coupled to this waveguide. Uh, so uh, this can be a good uh, source for uh, the silicon uh, the circuit. And the output power efficiency is around the 20%. And uh, one thing we have to that is actually the field of penetration is uh, stopped at this uh, gray meter. So it, uh, about, uh, when we look at the, this uh, DVR part, the field is 
considering penetrating to this uh, DVR. So if we employ this uh, break emitter, then we can reduce the effective cavity length considerably, and also we can achieve a smaller mode of volume that will result in a higher combined factor. So we can greatly improve uh, the performance of uh, this uh, laser compared to conventional pixels. So um, uh, from uh, simulation, uh, we uh, showed that around uh, 70 to 80 degrees, we could achieve a one milliwatt of power. That is a typical uh, operating uh, temperature of uh, the processor. So it will be uh, OK for uh, light source as an off-chip uh, interconnection. And uh, this is our fabricated sample, and uh, this is a cross-sectional image of uh, fabricated sample. So we can see that uh, we have uh, DVR here, and the interpose fine active, and the silicon gray. And uh, when we measure uh, microphotoluminescence, then uh, the line is, is a quite narrow. Actually, it is uh, limited by the spectrometer uh, the resolution. So Q factor is compatible to conventional pixel structure. And the way we uh, vary uh, this gradient parameter, then from the same IP, just by changing this uh, gradient patterning, we could uh, achieve a different wavelength. So this functionality is also quite adequate for the WDM capability. So our um, original purpose is for uh, some uh, datacom data uh, application, but at the same time, the same laser structure also can be used for some uh, level of chip based uh, some, uh, uh, some uh, uh, application. So for uh, this uh, small silicon chip, we need uh, some compact and energy efficient laser. And uh, then uh, this laser can be uh, also good uh, the, the candidate for that kind of applications. So um, uh, in order to investigate uh, the full short uh, the cavity length and also a short a photo lifetime, uh, I compare uh, the conventional pixel structure with the one lambda cavity. And uh, from the similar structure, T Berlin, they demonstrated a 40 gigabit um, the speed. And uh, if we employ the double grading, then we can clearly see that modal volume becomes very smaller. And the confinement factor is becomes uh, quite large. It's a 23%. But in conventional pixels, it's uh, between 3 to 4 percent. So compared to conventional pixel, confinement factor becomes quite large. So when we compare these two uh, structures, a small signal modulation, then you can see that at this modulation, uh, at this uh, injection current, uh, 3 dB uh, bandwidth becomes uh, quite large. So uh, I summarized uh, several different uh, the, uh, parameters. And when we vary at the injection current level, it's a modulation bandwidth uh, varies like this. And uh, this is a DVR uh, pixel, and uh, this is gradient meter pixel. So we can see that more than 30% speed improvement we can uh, expect. And uh, regarding the energy consumption per bit, we can also see that uh, considerable reduction is expected by employing this gradient meter. And um, uh, the, uh, in this graph, uh, x-axis is a modulation speed and y-axis is the energy consumption per bit. And this is conventional DPR pixel and this is our gray pixel. So we can see that at same energy consumption level, then the gray computer pixel gives us a much higher band, uh, the, uh, the modulation speed. But at the same modulation speed, uh, this gray computer uh, pixel gives us uh, quite smaller uh, energy consumption. So uh, if we need uh, quite small energy consumption, then uh, still we can get uh, close to 1 million copper power. So um, for off-chip uh, integration, uh, this uh, gradient meter based pixel can be a good uh, candidate for the max source. And uh, we can also integrate the uh, tunable uh, functionality. So uh, I theoretically uh, showed that the 100 nanometer tuning range can be obtained by this uh, grading uh, meter <coughs> that is uh, actuated by advanced technology. And one of our uh, recently graduated students uh, <coughs> experimentally demonstrated 
uh, this concept at the 1060 uh, on the laser. So basically, it was a design for OCT application, but it can also uh, use for uh, the native application. And uh, we are also investigating the detector version of uh, this structure. So uh, also SOI grading meter and the top input pipe grading will be actuated by the MEMS. Then the broad tuning range of 110 nanometer and the narrow detection line with around 0.3 to 0.4 nanometer can be detected, considering that the 10 gigabit signal uh, corresponds to around 1.0.1 nanometer. So this one is good for the WDM application. So for example, the WDM horn uh, uh, can be so So uh, this detector can be employed in the uh, active user side. And we are also uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, investigating um, application for uh, space division multiplexing and both division multiplexing. So um, in order to further increase the, uh, the, uh, the transmission band throughput, uh, people are trying to consider use, uh, to use multi-core fiber. And then we are trying to make a light uh, laser source for uh, these applications. And for both division of multiplexing, people are trying to use uh, several different spatial modes. And uh, we are also uh, trying to make a laser for uh, inside uh, each single board. So by modulating the grading uh, reflector the profile of the tone meter of the pixel, we can selectively choose uh, either one of these modes. And uh, single mode strength is uh, compatible to the state of our uh, surface. And uh, we can also um, the tilt uh, the uh, the beam profile. So uh, from the laser chip, currently, if we want to couple uh, several uh, the light output, then we need uh, some optics. But uh, from the laser. By chirping the grading uh, parameter, we can actually uh, the, the control the output of uh, beam angle. So uh, this experimental result shows that uh, uh, this uh, uh, the the center of beam measured at the different distances is moving to this direction, and we can also uh, the, the focus the beam from the pixel uh, by using the, the chirp the grading. Okay, so this is a summary of my talk. So um, possibly um, by employing the grading structure, we could achieve a directly modulated uh, 6 gigabit laser. And uh, we are also thinking of achieving 100 gigabit by using um, a different approach. And then the energy consumption can be um, uh, the smaller uh, than the 50 cathode per bit. And the uh, WDM feasibility, I mean, uh, we can change the wavelength easily for that 30 nanometer and uh, we can also make the laser tunable and the some application for uh, space division multiplexing and then we can do some beam shaping and so this concept can be applicable to uh, this wavelength. Um, yes, so thank you for your attention. And then you can do it uh, the uh, in vapor vapor scale. Yes, then we can move to the final speaker. Uh, the final speaker is uh, the Franklin uh, Franklin uh, Liu from Oracle from Microsystems. She will talk about the data centers.
So I'd like to begin with, uh, with an overview of what we're interested in doing uh, with uh, the local. So our main line of business is in database systems. And here we're not just talking about software for databases, but also a whole server systems which run database software. Uh, in addition to providing database systems, the company also provides a host of application frameworks that are built on top of the underlying database. In terms of what the database systems do, I'll probably divide uh, application into two main categories. One, of the only, one is the online transaction processing, or called the OLTP. And a common example of OLTP is your bank's ATM. So here there's a lot of transactions, such as withdrawing, checking, depositing money into your bank account. And the individual transactions are relatively simple, but there's just a lot of them. So to maintain consistent data requires sophisticated coherence and consistency protocols. And the second broad category is for online analytical processing applications, or just termed as OLAP. And a common example of OLAP is a query to figure out what merchandise a big store chain store should be stocking. Uh, and you can imagine uh, that involves complicated query processing to make this determination. In this case, the transactions are fewer in number, uh, but each individual transaction requires a lot of processing computing power. But as most of the data um, can be uh, operated in a static way, um, that is, there may be updates to this information, changing the fast rate, but instead of operating on the most current data, it is often sufficient to work on a snapshot in time of the database. Thus allowing a looser consistency, and we can live with that, and we don't have to worry too much about locking down the data when the data is changing. But there's still a heavy dosage of data transport um, for these queries, often requiring joining of data from different sources and aggregating uh, the relevant, relevant results. Uh, if, you start, if you start thinking about the computational requirements for these workloads, you find that OLTP requires a lot of switching, moving data around to the correct processing storage unit, and these units work in parallel distributed manner, requiring a lot of interprocessor communication to maintain consistency of the data memory uh, between cache storage and memory. Versus oil or key, on the other hand, requires a lot of data transfer. Okay. Sorry. Slide, yeah. that, uh, I will be going to the slides, oh. don't worry. Versus oil key, uh, we're too visually impaired, you know. <laughs> so, uh, oil, key, oil key, on the other hand, requires a lot of data transfer because typically the relevant, the relevant data set is stored in different storage nodes. Uh, while this data can be locally filtered at the storage node for the interesting queries, you really need to shuffle a lot of data from one or two storage nodes into a database server for the joining or the merging of data to occur. And it is in this joining process that significant data reduction can occur. So broadly speaking, one may need many short messages in an OLTP application requiring low latency as compared to fewer large trip data transfers in an OLAP application where latency is not so important as the overall throughput. From a hardware perspective, it is coming to a point that it's quite infeasible to create a low latency switch to handle so many, many to many port switching with parts to OLTP applications. For OLTP applications, there's just not enough bandwidth per area for power to accommodate all the traffic that enters the course to the database computational nodes. At least if you see the ceiling trends, it shows that traditional electrical links or service I.O. in and out of computational nodes is close to the limit in terms of bandwidth area and power constraints. And you know, primarily you can think of it as not having enough pad or bump room for the required, required communication. So one way of breaking this electrical barrier, as we mentioned in, um, uh, yesterday and today, is having very short hops between your computational engine and uh, optical uh, and an optical hop for longer reach between chips. So the optical electrical interface to CMOS chips uh, breaks this well on that by limiting the electrical channel dispersion really does allow I want to crack more data to a single pin, which then pops um, with less parasitic. So the short hop is less parasitic, so you can do that electrically and leave it longer hops for optical. Alternatively, one may opt for many short hops, i.e. encrypt that to electrical hops. So increase the bump density, thus each pin may carry much, uh, much less capacity, but the total aggregate electrical channel fulfills communication requirements. And the challenge of this approach is that it's mainly one of packaging. Um, that is, how do you bond two chips together via this high density interchip communication interconnect, while at the same time providing traditional bump technology for the rest of the chip, which requires uh, power and low signal communication. And there's also, when you, whenever you have such assembly, you have to be worried about um, thermal noise and mechanical stress caused by the joint assembly. So, about three years ago, um, Oracle Labs embarked on the 
DARPA unique program, um, which stands for the Ultra Performance um, Dam Photonic Interchip Communication Program. Great, some more blanks for you. So our team is divided into several groups. Uh, we have networking people in Europe, our architecture people in Austin, Texas, optical people in San Diego, California, and our circuits and packaging people both in San Diego and here at Redwood Shores. In addition, we have many collaborators in both industry and academics. Uh, so the big vision of the program was demonstrating a macro chip more the middle of many cores and memory interconnect, interconnected by optical channels sitting on a common optical substrate that serves as a mechanical carrier for the various dyes and optical backgrounds that provide interconnectivity between the sites. Each site is composed of a computational core or storage die with a flip chip bonded optical chip, which serves as the eye to the optical waveguides underneath. The traditional CMOS dies in this configuration sit on the carrier substrate facing up, while the attached optical chip faces down to bridge communication to the underlying substrate. Uh, and encapsulating above that is a power delivery system, and below we have uh, stuff for heat dissipation. The optical chips, as I mentioned, are um, hybrid bonded um, to the silicon chip via this in house design micro bond shown to the left, shown to the left over there. And uh, these are really uh, uh, small area, what makes them special that they are low area footprints and they have low parasitic capacitance. And this is important in comparison with non hybrid or standard packing solutions, which introduce channel no idealities, making IO a power hundred solution for off chip communication. For the first iteration, the inquired resonant rings for modulation. These rings are driven from the CMOS side, and in addition, rings are used for all the WDM mousing and mousing. On the receiving end, we have butt edge connected germaniums for detectors, again, electrically driven from the CMOS side. And uh, as I mentioned, light hops in and out of the optical chips via the gray mirrors and transverse the optical substrate to the destination of the chip. The link then consists um, uh, abstractly here of a light source coming from the left to right of a light source which enters the optical chip and then is modulated by ring modulators tuned to different wavelengths, which rings driven from the CMOS side. <coughs> and the modulated light travels to the underlying, underlying um, waveguides optical waveguide, and then they're picked up on the receiving optical chip, which then emulses the data via ring resonators, which in turn tap the light in the photo detector to signal that it's amplified and digitized at the CMOS end. The photo detector is a germanium detector sitting at the end of a rich waveguide with possible mirror kept at the other end. This sets a standing wave pattern, which is advantageous, advantageous for positioning of fingers at the optical nodes. The current of the photo detector is then converted to a voltage and sampled and digitized by a data slicer. So here we slicer. Uh, here, um, uh, and, and the sample energy is adjusted to align with the data. We also include a phase buffer in our energy buff, uh, budget because that bridges the chip's clock domain to the receiver's clock domain. And all these components um, have to be counted together. And as you mentioned, the unique program we're targeting for sub pico jewel, uh, transmitter receiver link budget. And this link budget does have severe implications on circuit design. For example, um, if we make a pop of the available SNR in the receiver, uh, the trade-off of power. So there's a, there's an optimum power point which get the best SNR for um, our circuits. But in order for us to um, meet the energy constraints of uh, the program, we actually operate at much lower SNR, or away from the optimum. Um, and the implication is that the smaller circuits also imply greater device to device variation and compact this variation. We have a significant amount of area overhead for calibration, uh, calibration circuit blocks. For the calibration, um, but these calibration blocks require less less power bandwidth really, because they do not need to be operated all the time. Uh, but the, and they are all done in the digital way. But they do occupy a lot of area because, as you imagine, for each of the circuits that requires calibration, you need a you know overhead of registers to store the, for the correction values. Um, with this circuit, we have demonstrated um, sub pico uh, bit links. Uh, the test apparatus here includes a CMOS chip, a bit bonded for optical chip containing modulators and photo detectors. The whole assembly is wire bonded to the PCB in green. And the, in the shown configuration, light comes from below, which is on the other side of the optical chip, and coupled to the uh, via bit guide on, on the optical chip via grading and directed to the photo detector, and then in turn connected to the amplifier detector on the CMOS side. Uh, the eye diagrams are shown here where brightness, uh, is the, the brightness contours correspond to BER, and this is done uh, various uh, supply voltages and on different samples. 
Um, now I'd like to dedicate the next part of the uh, rest of the talk to working with screen resonators, since a lot of components uh, use screen resonators, uh, ring resonators. We typically have electrodes to bias the ring resonators uh, to modulate the optical path. In addition, we also have two other electrodes which are used to control the temperature of the ring, so they're the heaters of the ring. So you can see a photo. Two for the uh, bias in the ring and two for tuning the ring. Um, and here's a typical resonance curve of these rings and the associated uh, resonance peak shift with the correct voltage. The driver is relatively simple. Uh, the only caveat is that we're operating at two, two volts, and high voltage swings might present a problem while driving at very low um, low voltage CMOS processes for a diagram of the um, modulated optical signal from a, uh, from a test sample structure. One of the main challenges from working with strings is their variability. And here we show resonant peaks. So each dot corresponds to a resonant peak of uh, various uh, samples so on the same die and across different uh, wafers, wafer lots. And you can actually see almost a uniform distribution of resonance peaks across the same die or different lots. The implication of this is that of this wide variation is a necessity to individually tune each ring. And one method to, to do that is to control the temperature of the ring. Uh, but in order so that this tuning is not so power hungry, uh, we cannot have all the heating energy escaping from the ring. And so we try to you know, etch away as much as we can around the ring. So they're pretty much suspended um, in insulation and just have small uh, silicon fingers holding it up. Uh, and uh, that increases the thermal resistance of the ring. And the structure, the structure becomes much more energy efficient to heat because the, heat is, the injected heat is trapped there and only slowly leaks away. Uh, we put also a local tap, light tap, to measure um, the amount of light uh, in the ring, and we use this light to uh, temperature adjust the ring and to bring it into resonance. Um, so just so you get an idea of the amount of active CMOS area used to do just the temperature compensation, here I want to show um, so the MOD, uh, sort of the, for the center, that's just the modulator circuits. Uh, the rest, the tuner FSM, heating accumulator, IDAP. Uh, that was shifted. Those are all just for um, controlling the temperatures of the ring. And here is the receiver side. So you can see, like, almost um, you know, more than 50% of the area is just for tuning. And it's not complicated circuits, it's just that you, know, you need a certain amount of power to tune the rings. Uh, in addition, uh, to combat uh, process variations, uh, ring resonation also suffers from um, self heating. That is, when you're just heating at zero, the light gets diverted into the ring, causing localized heating of the ring, just thus shifting its resonance peak. And similarly, when you transmit the one, the ring, the ring goes down. Uh, we can't use the previously described feedback loop to compensate for this resonance shift because the feedback loop that I shown previously um, cannot really differentiate between environmental temperature shifts versus data. Now, of course, you can scramble the data so that in the average sense, you know, you just try, you can use that loop to control it. But even with scrambled data, there's enough of a shift in the resonance peak to affect the signal level. And um, what, uh, so here's uh, just just measuring plot of uh, how the uh, the gray area is where the data is shifting. So there's a lot of edges in the gray area, so it's just a big block for you. But what's happening is that I'm sending a bunch of one zeros, one zeros on the left, and at some point, I uh, just begin to send a bunch of zeros, and uh, what happens is that the ring hits up and that changes the resonance peak, and the black curve there is our threshold. So if, if I did not do anything and continue with the black curve, then that would actually entail um, error. And, um, but by measuring, by adding the circuit that I was uh, shown that we try to track the modulation level, then we can adjust the, uh, uh, adjust the threshold to compensate for this resonance peak shift. Um, see. And uh, here is just similar, just to give an idea of the size of things. So the the receiver is on the top left, really, just the two blocks, the black box over there. Um, there's some phase buffers again to do phase alignment and the DLL to like do uh, phase alignment with that receiver pop. Uh, but the rest is just calibration stuff, you know, low low frequency stuff that does the correction and so forth. So again, a lot of area devoted to just that kind of stuff. Um, so some of our remarks, so I hope that you got an overview of the optical efforts that we've done at the labs. Uh, but in addition, I just want to leave the idea that you know, we do a lot of other stuff, such, such as uh, we're trying, looking for different architectures, like putting compute closer to the memory, closer to the network, 
a protector for better power use for if you have many low power uh, nodes and just more dense low power memory. Thanks. Okay, so just just give it here. So like I said, in the next generation, like uh, for the switch, which we have today, in the order of three hundred to three hundred parts. Uh, so existing electrical solutions are no go there. All right. So maybe that gives you an answer because we have to go into optics. And I wonder, do you have a clear defined target for the apps? You guys propose some kind of products or, or applications in your data center? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the things that we presented are, um, well, from a type of perspective, they are sort of like toys right, to show that we can achieve such low power. But in reality, um, you know, we, we probably don't have to shift to such low power and develop more robust things uh, when you're actually in the data center. So, so yeah, so we, we relax some of those, like I showed in that plot of SNR versus power. So we don't have to live down there at low SNR for our circuits. We can be a much, um, you know, better position for us and transmit the higher rates, for example. You know, do different kind of trade-offs right, for real systems. Because you guys work on this one scary to us because you're supposed to be in customer support on us. If you do this, we have no customers at all, and you are a competitor, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, that's, uh, thanks again.